Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Apologies for a slight delay in start. We had to take care of a few technical things before we could go live. We're all set now and let's welcome our guest of the evening, Utsav Chakrabarti. Utsav, Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. How are you? Namaste Sri. I'm doing good. How, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thanks for asking Utsav and viewers, please like this video because Utsav has put in a lot of effort trying to tell us a perspective of what led to this win of Gate Wilders. By the way, Heat Wilders is not yet out of the woods. He has only got 23% or 24% of the popular vote. So he needs help from other like-minded parties to come together to form the government. So it's not time to light the cigar yet. But having said that, I'm going to yield the floor to Utsav. Before that, please like this video. And if you have not subscribed to our channel, please do subscribe to our channel. Over to you, Utsav. You have a presentation deck to show to us. So go ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, there you go. So, Sri, what is very interesting is that this is for the first time in Europe, especially in Western Europe, where somebody who the mainstream uh, usually doesn't consider as a proper, quote-unquote, proper politician, a proper mainstream politician who is considered right of center, who is considered extremist in his views. Uh, this is the first time that somebody in Europe is breaking ice, especially in Western Europe. Uh, I mean, there have been other... In, in Italy, there has been a change of power on all, but nobody expected Gert Wilders to be winning and coming up with such a big number in Netherlands. And that's, that's a huge event in Europe's uh, political scenario, if I may put it that way. And it will actually open up um, many more such opportunities for other leaders, especially in countries like France, in, 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 uh, in Germany, I, I believe. So those two countries are uh, almost ready for similar, you know, similar changes. And what is very interesting is that Gert Wilders is one of the few people, politicians in Europe, who is openly anti-Islamic, no ifs and buts. And he's also one of the few people in Europe who is uh, who has openly spoken against Quran and who has openly spoken against Prophet Muhammad, which is, you know, it, it, in Islam, in, you know, as I, as I look at it, you can cross lines on the Quran and be critical. There have been people who have been critical. But the least tolerance that you find amongst Muslims is any criticism of the Prophet. And, and that is, I think, uh, that's something that Gert Wilders has done in the past, continues to do so. In fact, he's the only European politician who actually stood up for Nupur Sharma when Nupur Sharma was wrongly, wrongly targeted for just quoting something uh, from, the, from the Hadiths. And, and I think, you know, that's something that, uh, that carries a lot of weight to have such a politician find so many, so much support in Europe and probably, in my opinion, uh, be, be the leader of Netherlands in the next few few weeks, I must say. So this is huge and we need to look at it. What's up today? Today, there are riots and protests, and not riots, but protests in Kashmir because a Muslim girl has fallen in love with a Hindu boy who studies in NIT Kashmir, in Correct. NIT Srinagar. What nonsense is this? I mean, which age are we in? These are all bloody Hindus to start with, man. 200, 300 years, years ago, you were forcibly converted. Wake up. Have some sense of your culture and history. You I'm talking to all these misguided Muslim youth of Kashmir. Don't fall for all this rhetoric. You were Hindus too. So there are two Stop things I ahead. would say about that, Sri. Number one. If you look at the latest Pew survey on India, on attitudes about religion and politics in India, the most insular community when it comes to interfaith marriage uh, is the Muslim community. It's, you know, Hindus always get a bad name and a bad rep for, you know, for opposing love jihad, for opposing, you know, it, it's all over the place. You open Washington Post and you, it looks like India is a place where, you know, Hindus are up in arms for whatever. But the reality is the Pew Research Survey shows that the biggest opposition to any interfaith marriage, especially of women, comes from the Muslim community. And it's it's a Pew Survey. So it's it's I'm, I'm assuming that people who claim Pew to be neutral would take it seriously. And this is the same thing with the Indian leftists and the Indian secularists. They, they will go to Kingdom Come complaining about how uh, love jihad is, is, is something that Hindus are 
up our in arms against and criticizing all the time but they will not, not say a single word when hindus are targeted and hindus are killed actually for doing the same you know for interfaith marriage so you know there there is hypocrisy here there is a serious uh, uh what how should i put it there there is a serious lack of transparency in terms of honesty here uh but we have to deal with what we have at hand and just go forward you know i i do not believe that holding a moral high ground on this on this issue has any value you know we we deal with the real world that is out there and be open about it and be honest about it so but but you know, coming back to gert wilder see i mean he's he has been out there in this space and he has actually you know a very interesting background and i wanted to show this slide to you because you know when people read in newspapers especially in western newspapers that he's extreme right wing or he's he's right wing you would assume certain things about this guy but there are like you know things that we need to know about this guy and then actually you know we begin to start questioning how right wing is he is he actually you know he is a guy who is openly in support of lgbtq community you know not something that usually uh, people perceive the right wing to be associated with uh, he is somebody who is uh, very much in support of israel has lived in israel for uh, for a couple of years in a kibbutz actually uh he is not a wi- pure white guy he's his mother is half indonesian so you know so he is one uh, quarter indonesian then he is one quarter indonesian so yeah there you go so he's he's one quarter asian as, as they would say in america <laughs> so he he is not the stereotypical extremist right wing guy that people assume you know that branding to be and and he's also very interesting in terms of how he looks at immigration he's not against legal immigration by the way he's only against illegal immigration and that too from islamic countries because and this is something i want to go into detail uh, about gert wilders and many people of his genre of politics so you see there is what is happening in europe is that there is a whole generation of young european politicians especially in france belgium holland and all these places who associate the demographic collapse of the european communities and the literal takeover of many places in western europe by muslims who are very aggressively islamist you know non integrating you know on your face quran thumping uh, islamists taking over parts of europe to a uh, historical uh, events that unfolded many uh, many hundred years ago so you know while west of the world looks at the world you know looks at history of interaction between islam and christianity through the crusades you know most people in india most people in america usually believe that you know islam and and christianity's early interactions were happening in in the form of crusades and in the form of conquest of spain but what most people in europe especially people from the background where you know these guys come from gert wilders and european politicians like Le- marine le pen comes from they have a lot of memory of the battle of tours from with charles martel which is when the the islamic umayyad uh, conquest of spain wanted to expand into france and at the battle of tours charles martel along with a bunch of european kings who joined hands and kind of fought them off and defeated them and the, that's the that's the time the 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 europeans saved themselves from islam from the south you know coming up from spain and then similarly in, if you go towards central europe if you go towards germany and austria they have the memory of the battle of vienna when an, another 700 years later 800 years later the ottoman muslims the ottoman turks were trying to conquer uh, vienna and you know there was a very famous battle of vienna siege of vienna followed by the battle in which the the polish army and the polish and the lithuanians newly converted to catholicism actually came down south and defeated the the conquering muslim army so these 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 historical events have a lot of memory in the minds of uh, minds of these people in europe you know very not very difficult different from how people in northern india look at the battle of panipat except that in in these battles the the european sides won and they were able to defeat the islamic conquest so you know people like uh, gert wilders people like marine le pen they hark back to this time in history and how their own ancestors were successful in defeating the expansion of islamism in europe and that that's what their inspiration and their you know main main political out, 
outlook comes from. So, so that, that, that's something we need to look at. And, and now next, I wanted to talk about Gert Wilder and, and his personal journey. Uh, so his, his journey basically involved uh, standing up for free speech in Netherlands, you know, something that is not very commonly practiced in uh, in America anymore. You know, we have that conversation going on in America a lot nowadays. I have my daughter showing up here now, so <laughs> she, she's gonna give you say a hi to her. <laughs> you wanna ha you wanna join in? No. Okay, then get a, go from here. Go from here. I this. So you know. <laughs> So what Why happened? Why isn't she sleeping? It's eleven thirty at night. I know, I know. She just had a four and a half hour sleep, <laughs> and she's here to say hello. So, okay, go with mommy. Go with mommy. She's wide awake. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. She's gonna stay up probably all night uh, now that she had her four and a half hour sleep. But coming back to our topic, so you know, Gert Wilder had a very, very uh, honest uh, outlook towards free speech. And that earned him, you know, uh, a lot of bad reputation at a time when people, especially politicians in Europe or for that matter, anywhere in the world, would not be standing up from the type of free speech that Gert Wilders did. I mean, he backed the movie Fitna, which was actually banned in most countries. Uh, he went and showed that movie in the U.S. Congress. Uh, and then he had a Al-Qaeda issue uh, De death threats to him. He's at the top of their uh, list of people that uh, Al Qaeda wants to kill. Many of his associates, including Vince, uh, Vincent Van, Van Gogh's great grandson, uh, Theo Van Gogh, was murdered. And then uh, another Dutch politician was murdered uh, because of, uh, of the support that they were giving to the movie Fitna. So, you know, there is uh, there's a lot of history in which uh, Gert Wilders has has seen how how he can be targeted. Many of his compatriots who have been critical of Islam have been killed. You know, Salman Rushdie just recently came out from a vicious attack th that almost killed him. So you know, let's see what happens. Like th this is a very fascinating change in in Europe's uh, politics. You know, every time somebody tries to fight back, they go into this victim shell and then start. You know crying and chest beating and thumping and things like that. Look at the current ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. Absolutely. So they keep saying 20,000 people were killed in Gaza. Can you show us the bodies? I'm, I'm being a neutral observer here. I really, really am. Now that there is a ceasefire, you one can go in and see, take count and give us a number. You one itself is not playing, you know, a, an umpire now. Uh, really, I mean, between you and me, Utsav, do you know how many people actually, civilians actually died in Gaza thus far? No, there is no actual figure and there is no evidence of... See, the, the, the problem is that this is this has nothing to do with reality. The wars and the information that surround the wars that are happening today are all wars of perception. So if you are able to create a perception that you are the victim, you automatically generate support from clueless millions across the world. And you ride on that support for as long as you can until you create the next narrative that works for you. So it's basically a battle of narratives that, that we are living in. And uh, and current situation in Israel is very much, you know, I mean, you don't have to look how India is perceived in America and how Hindus are perceived in America is, is the same story. You know, they create this narrative. If you read New York Times and Washington Post, most people who are Hindutva would be presented as bloodthirsty, you know, Paul Potts of the world in in the in the view of these media outlets. So, you know, it's a battle of perceptions. But but people are fighting back. I mean, as you can see, nobody expected him to get this kind of support in Netherlands. And and I can assure you, people in France are watching. And it's a matter of time before similar political leaders show up and, and, and take power in France as well. So it's 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 happening. So uh, are we done with the presentation? Yes, I, I, think, I think, yeah, from my side, it's done. I just wanted to, you know, highlight the fact that it's, it's not as simple as just one more right-wing politician coming to power in Europe. It's more okay. uh, serious than uh, th this is something that I added. Uh, essentially, what happened was there's a Jewish professor in University of Southern California 
who had made some comments that uh, Hamas terrorists were murderers and should be killed. And for that, there was a huge backlash. The, the university put him on administrative leave for some time. And then now he has been cleared. He's actually apologized also to teach remotely. See, the thing is, what was he saying that was wrong? I put this thing mainly to ask that question. What was he saying that was wrong? I mean, I can assure you that there are hundreds of professors who have gone online and said that the Israeli army, literally you switch the, the words and say the Islam, Israeli armies are murderers or Netanyahu are murderers, is a murderer. And they are perfectly fine. They, they are they're enjoying their uh, faculty positions and you know so it's it, there is a big hypocrisy out here and i think it, i'm glad that this is coming out because just like there are millions who are clueless about what the reality is similarly there are millions who are watching this and are figuring out that this is completely going out of control and there needs to be a reset in terms of education and information very true and i have a few questions from our viewers let me just pull them up. Here we go. Magnet Ranga wants to know, uh, Utsavji, Namaskar. Once Europe stops entry to Islamic refugees, can and should the world seek opening of borders of Islamic nations for such refugees? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the, you, you, you can see in today's crisis, uh, nobody wants the Palestinian refugees. Uh, they, they are like, okay, fine, you know, we, we will make all the noises against Israel and against, as you know, Netanyahu and all. But nobody wants the refugees. Similarly, uh, I mean, what the Europeans have ended up with is that they have a bunch of extremists in their own countries now who are more extremists than the Middle Eastern communities or the North African communities that they are coming from. I mean, it needs to be noted that one of the highest per capita recruitment to ISIS was not from Middle Eastern countries or from the Indian subcontinent. It was from the European countries where the Muslim population was happy to see themselves, you know, die and kill and enslave people for the sake of a caliphate. So, yeah, so this is a good point. This needs to be brought up. I think Western countries should bring it up. America should talk about it. Uh, European countries should talk about it. Let them talk about all these uh, issues with their Middle Eastern counterparts. Uh, Utsav, I don't know if you know the latest on this, but hasn't uh, Rishi Sunak passed a new legislation that kind of strips all the rights that illegals have upon landing in UK now? There are There's a higher standard now or something like that, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes, yes. In fact, what he has done has is also been criticized because many people, including uh, the, the recent, the previous Home Minister, Home Secretary who just resigned, uh, Suela, Suela Braverman. Yeah. yeah. So she actually has been publicly critical of what he's doing, saying that it's not enough. And she's actually saying that they need to be deported back to the countries of origin uh, promptly without you know any further delay. So, yeah, there is a there is a huge movement in many of these countries where they can't take it anymore. You know, they just they are not able to deal with this anymore. And uh, I think there needs to be a conversation, honest conversation on this with the countries of Middle East that these countries should have. So um, the reality today, viewers, is that uh, on, on a given day, there are 20 to 40,000 people. They are hanging in a sort of a, like an open air prison on Calais, on this, the other side, on France, on the other side of the English Channel, what, waiting to cross into uh, Great Britain because they were, they were told that as soon as you land, doesn't matter whether you're legal or not, you get you know free health insurance, you get dole, you get housing, blah, 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 all these things. Everybody is extremely literate about these things. And, and now I think that bust, that bubble is going to bust. But the interesting thing I'm hearing is there are some other countries where if you try to come by ship, they're actually torpedoing the ship. Yes. I mean, the Italians and the Greeks are very upset uh, at, at what is happening. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to say that Sunak should just put them in a ship and send them to Canada. Uh, and, uh, and and put them in, in the places where the Khalistanis are. And let's see what happens after that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, yeah. So European countries are, are eventually going to have to deal with this because their economies are collapsing. And, uh, you know, they are in a very bad shape. Most of their economies are in a very bad shape. And this is unsustainable for them. And beyond a point, you know, people like 
Gert Wilders will win and they will come to power and they will make laws that will push back on these things. By the way, Gert Wilders was also not very, very much in support of the war in Ukraine. Uh, but he kind of mellowed down after Russia invaded. So let's see what happens on that aspect. Yes, indeed. And again, we are, there is still many a slip between the cup and the lip. He has only 23% of the vote and he needs to muster at least two other parties. The, uh, the outgoing administration is also a right wing, but they are not exactly in sync with the Heat Wilders. So they are saying, we'll give you outside support. Yeah. Remember Congress? Remember outside support? Remember how it usually ends? So the same thing happens in Holland also, I'm afraid. I don't want to be the harbinger of something that's not very good. At the same time, there is hope. Hope floats eternal. And we'll have to wait and see how that plays out. Um, Utsav, thank you so much for staying up late to be part of this hangout. You've thrown some excellent information, brought up some new insights. And I think as a as a community, the moderate voice of Islam must have must find its voice. If you don't do that, you know what? You are going to get painted with the same brush. Okay. At that point, you cannot say, no, 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 no. I was very moderate. I was very respectful of all other religions. Nobody has patience at that point of time. The water has gone about your their head. That's what's going to happen. So I've been saying this for two, three years now. I see once in a while somebody come up and say that, yes, we oppose this. But then we don't know the pressures they are they are under. And, and we can only say that, you know, we will we are with you as long as you come out and speak the truth. Thanks once again, sir. Namaskar. So, Sri, I just wanted to add one quick thing. So, yes. you use the word moderate. I just wanted to say the reformed or reformist Muslim voice. See, because the term, I, I, I once had a very fantastic debate with a person who, who asked me to define moderate Islam. And I, I could not. So, <laughs> <laughs> because there is no line that you can place somebody on the right side or the left side of to say, okay, this is moderate Islam. But reform the Muslims is the phrase I use much more you know, confidently because in doing so, you actually start respecting the law of the land and the, and the rules and the legislations and the, and the constitutions of the countries you are living in. And that's why I, I you know, I, that, that's the only change I wanted to make, reformed Islam. And if I remember correctly, last point, UK allows even its non-citizens to vote. Correct. What is this? You guys are the paragons of democracy that your politics is about everything else. What happened? I mean, the, the problem is even San Jose wants to now allow illegals to vote. There you go. See, because <laughs> it, it's it's a chase, it's a it's a chase of the vote that they believe will be theirs. Uh, and, you know, I, I can see a day when Democrats would make it legal for non-American citizens to vote because there is a perception that in doing so, they are going to be the beneficiaries. So, you know, th that's what comes with it. <laughs> yes, indeed. And in fact, uh, Trump has said that he will make this his number one priority to round up all the illegals and show them the door. And one of the things, by the way, you may like him or hate him, but he had really brought immigration under control, illegal immigration under control. Seriously. Yes. And I know making it proper and legal. See, there are, there is, a, if you really feel that your economy needs immigrants and, you know, the economy actually grows. I mean, there, there is a lot of data that shows that immigrants actually help the economy. Yes. Make it legal. That's, that's the biggest, the biggest point here. Make it legal because then, you know, you have a system where things work. Make it legal, make it open, more open, give a lot. You know, why aren't they allotting more visas to people from India? Or why aren't, make it better and people will come. But this whole illegal, illegal thing is very hard to justify and support. Yes, indeed. Thank you once again, Utsav. And viewers, please like, share and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to click on the bell button for notifications. Namaskar. Namaste.